How is everybody today? How many of you believe that you can motivate another person? Let's get a raise of hands. Okay? Now I'm going to ask a question or a series of questions. <clears throat> they are rhetorical. Did somebody wake you up this morning? Did somebody brush your teeth for you? Did somebody take that washcloth with the soap and make sure that your back got cleaned? I'm guessing, see, the rhetorical. <clears throat> Did somebody put the cornflakes on the spoon and put them right in your mouth for you this morning? Let me guess, somebody drove you to this conference today, right? You had that driver that brought you here. Yes, there I did. <laughs> right? Somebody did. It's a great thing, isn't it? Awesome. Folks, organizational behaviorists will tell you that no human being can motivate another. However, we as human beings can create an environment whereby those that we work with and deal with become motivated to be around us. So let me ask another question. Are any of you tonight, when you leave, going home where there will be a significant other, a loved one, a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, family member? Envision for me this. If you wanted to, could you make their night the best night ever? Could you make it so that... I was talking about ordering something on Netflix. But could you make it so that dinner was exactly what they wanted? Could you make it so that the environment was exactly that? The, the wine, if you're a wine drinker, it was the, going to the movies. If you have a child, it was taking them to batting practice. Could you do that? Could you make it so that they would say, wow, you really made my night. Okay, so let's take it the other direction. Could you make it such that within five or ten minutes of you coming home, that they would look at you and go, I'm out of here. <laughs> Guys, we know that feeling when we go home. We get it. So you really can create an environment whereby somebody that you wish to be involved in your life, in your time, in what you're doing, you can create an environment that they want to be a part of. But the key is that you have to understand a little bit about that person so that you can create that environment. How many of you know who Jeffrey Bezos is? A couple hands up, right? What does Mr. Bezos own? Amazon. Amazon. He had a good day yesterday. What happened to Mr. Bezos yesterday? I'm sorry? His profits went up so much that in 20 minutes his stock price went up enough that his net worth went up by $6 billion. Good day to be Mr. Bezos. What else does Mr. Bezos own? The Washington Post. Okay, so let's think a second about Amazon and the Washington Post. How are they similar? Why would this gentleman, who is wildly successful with this business that he's built called Amazon, why would he ever want to buy a newspaper? Newspapers are going away, are they not? Do you know what he said when he was asked that by a group that were analyzing his investment? Do you know what he said? He said this. He said, because I can transform the Washington Post into what Amazon is. 
And what he said was, when my customers come to Amazon, I throw a party. And in that party, they want to come back. I know my customer, I know what they like, and I throw a party. So let's take Mr. Bezos for uh, a, a moment and think about this. Imagine now you've been invited to a party. It's your best friend. And you attend that party, and at that party, the music that's playing is exactly the kind of music you love. The people that are there are the friends that you really want to hang out with, spend time with, and have conversation with. The food, it's phenomenal. It's the food that you've been craving, and wow, they have it there, and it's cooked and prepared remarkably. And that wine, it's that Italian Barolo from 2010 when it was perfect in Tuscany. And it was wow. No, I'm not a wine of but, but, but it was wow, and it really tasted great. So the next time they threw a party, would you sign up to go? What if you were invited to a party, and you arrived, and the music was like fingernails on a chalkboard? We all know that music. It's what the kids listen to. And the alcohol or the drinks they served, nothing that you wanted. Zero. Had no interest in. And the food? Terrible. Wasn't gluten free. It wasn't this. It, I can't eat a thing. And the people? Oh my gosh, they're terrible. I wouldn't hang out with those people if you paid me again. If they invited you to a party again, would you go? Huh. Mr. Einstein has a definition of insanity, doesn't he? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We're here today to think about volunteerism. And volunteers bring a couple of things to us, don't they? They bring time, they bring talent, and they bring treasure. And any one in itself is nice to have, but boy, isn't it great when you can have all three. Think about your organization for a second. Do you know enough about the volunteers you have or the volunteers you're seeking to be able to throw a party that they would want to be a part of? Do you know what motivates them? If you're trying to attract a business to be part of your world, to help you to carry out your mission, do you just go knock on the door and go, hey, please, I need your help. Or do you really know enough about them to be able to say, I'm throwing a party and I think I know you well enough, you'd really like to be a part of this party. Do you know what drives those people to give time? And it's one thing to ask for a check, but a check is a moment. A volunteer can be loyalty forever. And do you understand how to bring that together so that you've truly and will be throwing a party where they want to be there? And are you attracting the right businesses and people to be your volunteers based on the party that you're trying to throw? Having taught graduate school for 20 years, I know stories are what resonate with people. If I gave you statistics, you'll remember it for a minute. I'll give you a story, you'll remember it to take home. So here's a story for you. 
gentleman by the name of Stephen Little. He was a traveling consultant salesperson. And Mr. Little was on airplanes all the time. True story. And he had a little ritual that if he had a really good day, and you can define really good day however you want, but if he had a really good day, at the end of the day, he wanted to treat himself to something. And that something was a vanilla milkshake. Sounds good, doesn't it? On this nice hot spring day that we're having, right? <laughs> Break out the gloves and the head, you know, the ear warmers. It's spring in Maryland. And on one of those trips that he was taking, he landed at BWI, and there was a nasty thunderstorm. We all know those in the summer, right? And so his flight was delayed. It had been a long day. He had a great day where he was, and he was coming to our region. And all he could think about was, I want to get to the hotel. I want a vanilla milkshake. And baggage claim, right? They can't get that right, can they? So it took forever. And he thought, OK, my flight was so late, I should be able to get a cab right away. Because nobody's going to be here. And of course, the line for cabs were forever. This was pre-Uber, folks. <laughs> and so he finally gets a cab. And he's staying at the Marriott downtown in Baltimore. And he's thinking, this is great. There'll be nobody in line. I'm going to check in. I want a vanilla milkshake. So he gets in the lobby, and sure enough, the line is forever long. And if he's like me, I'm ready to take somebody out. <laughs> and he finally gets checked in, and he gets to his room, and he calls room service. He's had it, right? You know this. You feel this. He wants a party. He wants a milkshake. And he says, do you have vanilla milkshakes? And this is not a Red Roof Inn, ladies and gentlemen. This is a nice hotel in downtown Baltimore. And they say, I'm sorry, sir, we do not. He goes, wow. He goes, let me ask a question. Do you have milk? <laughs> yes, sir. Do you have vanilla ice cream? Yes, sir. Do you have one of those tall iced tea glasses? Yes, sir, we do. Last question. Do you have one of those tall iced tea spoons? Yes, sir. Send them up. And voila, he had a milkshake. Mr. Little wrote a book called The Milkshake Moment. Get it. Although I'm going to give you the, the Cliff Notes version. But get it. It's a great book. It's easy to read. Even I can do it. And I actually had a chance to meet him. He stopped being a traveling sales guy and became what I'm doing for you today. And he got up on a stage and he talks to groups. But what he talked about was we limit ourselves in our ability to throw that party every single day because we try to do what we've always done and we get frustrated when we get what we've always gotten. And the four things that Mr. Little highlights in his book, I'm going to give to you. And the first is managing resources. As a nonprofit, you have unlimited resources, correct? <laughs> Sure you do. You've got ATM machines throwing cash at you. You have more people lined up to help you than you can possibly stop coming in the door. You've got people that can't have enough of your organization. But you know what? I'll bet you most of you put your head down and that's what you think. But you're not thinking creatively enough to the resources that you actually probably have available to you. No different than the Marriott and the Hyatt and the Hilton and the Ritz-Carlton did probably in his trip. And if you read his book, he'll tell you 
over half the hotels that he stayed in in his travel would say, I'm sorry, sir, no vanilla milkshakes. But you know what the problem was? All right, have any of you been in hospitality management? Anybody? What would you guess? I'm gonna, they won't let me get off the stage. There's a line here I'm not allowed to cross. <laughs> I love to travel in, in the room, right? What do you think it was? What would you guess? Part of that stuff was part of the restaurant, and part of that stuff was in room service. And they didn't talk to each other. You say, geez, but my gosh, you do it every day. I don't even know you, and I know you do it. We all do it. Are we really thinking about what resources we have? Are we really thinking about the way that, hey, you've got a nonprofit, I've got a nonprofit. What if we shared something? You might have something that you don't need all of, but I might have something that you do. And what if we work together? God, that would be incredible. Do you realize the benefit of today is not listening to me? It's did you walk away with the business card of everybody in this room? And then did you spend the time to say, hey, how could we work together to both meet what we're trying to achieve collectively? Because I might have something that's a competency, you might have something that's a competency, and together we're both gonna win. And if you're not thinking that way, you've got a few hours left to think that way. The value I always used to tell students in the classroom is it's not me, it's the students that were in the class around you. That's the value that you're going to get. That's the perspective that you're going to gain. That's the value that you're going to go away with. How many of you network? Why are you networking? You should be saying, hey, I'm trying to do this and I'm coming up short there, but I got something. Can I help you? Can I help you? Hey, I know the guy down the street. He's looking just for that. Can I make that connection for you? And all of a sudden, you become a hero. Number two process. A really smart process can overcome stupidity. <laughs> but a really stupid process can't be saved by even a lot of smarts. Are you developing processes to deal with your situation that are replicatable, that are scalable, that your employees understand, that your board members understand, that your stakeholders understand, that your potential volunteers understand? Or are you trying to wing it every time something else comes up? I love it. Somebody goes, yeah, we're putting on a big gala. How many times have you done it? Oh, this is our 10th annual. And I'm losing my hair. Why, you've done it 10 times. How tough is it? You've done it 10 times. But you do it, right? You see it happen, right? It's incredible. Process is an incredible tool when used appropriately. Purpose, number three. Whether Mr. Little did this survey, and I don't think he did, but he found it somewhere, he found that over two-thirds of employees do not understand the mission of their organization enough to know why they're doing what they're doing. And let's even say that's in the for-profit community. Great. I'll bet you there's a corollary to the not-for-profit community. Any of you have kids, right? Any of you been to Disney? What's the one thing Disney does really well? Somebody. Customer experience, what else? I'm sorry? Entertainment? Do you know what, I'm sorry, has anybody worked for Disney? Do you know what they tell their employees? Their job is? To make your day the best day ever. I'm serious, to make your day the best day ever. I'll never forget 
and I'd, ha I'd have to figure out how many years ago, let's say it was 20, when Nordstrom's came to this market, how many of you like to shop at Nordstrom's? Okay, so you'll appreciate this. I'm not a shopper, so, but you'll appreciate this. I remember the first Nordstrom's that came to this market came to Towson in Maryland. And there was a business event like this where they brought the manager in. And she was like, she walked on water because this company called Nordstrom's, which at the time was known for its shoe department ladies, where it was going to be the newest cutting edge retail ever. And somebody asked her as she was standing on the stage, what kind of a training program does Nordstrom bring to their sales employees, their floor employees, to be as good as Nordstrom's is? And do you know what she said how long the training program was? What would you guess? One day. I'm sorry? One day. One day. What else would you guess? Daily, what else? Um, training program. Training program. Ah, you're getting close. Do you hear the gentleman? He said 15 minutes, five minutes. Because what she said was, we only hire people that already understand how to deliver solid customer service. The only thing we train them in is how to run the cash register. I'm not laughing, it's, it's true. They knew that their goal was to deliver the best customer service. If you came in to buy a woman's scarf, they were going to make sure you got the women's scarf. Or if you were looking for a men's tie, they made sure that you walked out with exactly what you wanted. Disney does the same thing. Do your employees do the same thing? Do your board members do the same thing? Do your board members, I'm going to pick because I'm a board member. Do your board members, if they're at a cocktail party, know enough to espouse how great your organization is so that everybody who is there fully understands the mission of exactly what you do so that when they leave that party everybody's like wow I want to be part of that party I assume those of you that are executive directors try to do that maybe not on Friday night you're tired but doesn't that make sense are they doing that ask yourself that that's a rhetorical question number four passion I have none of it. Passion. <laughs> you don't have to have a lot of passion for everything you do, but you damn sure better have a lot of passion for what you do a lot of. You don't have to have a lot of passion for everything you do, but you had damn sure better have a lot of passion for everything you do a lot of. Rhetorical, do you? Do your employees? Do your board members? Do your volunteers? Because you all thought about that party that I talked about just a few minutes ago, and you were getting passionate about that, weren't you? When you were thinking about whatever that steak was, with that great bottle of wine and the music and all those great people that you wanted to hang with, you got pretty passionate about that. Are you doing that in your organization? And I always love that the number one thing that I always hear, whether I'm dealing in a public boardroom, a private boardroom, or in a nonprofit, we don't have the resources. For those of you with a little bit of gray hair, maybe receding, may remember a television show in the 1980s called MacGyver. How many of you remember MacGyver? Right? Bring on the mullet. <laughs> remember he had the mullet. That was in style then. It might be in style in some places today. But I don't have the hair to do it, nor the will. And Richard Dean Anderson played an ex military operative who would be placed, for those of you that are a lot younger than me, would be placed in a tough situation and he would have his little, you know, uh, Swiss Army knife and he can concoct out of, remember this show? And he could concoct just out of a little bit of stuff could make something happen. Do any of you speak Portuguese? Anybody in the room? No, seriously. Okay, so when I butcher this word, you won't laugh at me. <laughs> Desen Rosconsco. 
Descend Roscansco is a Portuguese word which means to come up with a solution when you have nothing in which to do it and to be creative in its development. And then if you look in the dictionary, like MacGyver. <laughs> I kid you not. Desen Rascansco, it's a Portuguese word. So as you're thinking about this and you're thinking about resources and you're saying I have no resources and I can't get anything done, I'm gonna challenge you and say, really? Are you thinking right? To Mr. Little's point, are you thinking of the resources that you actually have? Your resource management. Are your people aligned properly? Are you attracting the right volunteers? Are you bringing in the right kinds of things? Will you throw in that right party? Because if you're not clicking on all those cylinders, then you've got a stupid process that can't be overcome with even all the smarts that you apply to it. So I know somebody is teaching strategic planning here and I certainly do not mean to step on your world. But I want to give you a tool that you can use for planning that you'd even be able to teach to a high school student. Simple, right? And I've done this long enough, I know it works. Your brain has three great capabilities. The first is vision. We have the ability and our brains have the ability to think of a situation and be able to articulate that vision. Whether it's a business plan, whether it's a vacation, whether it's a party, but you can articulate a vision and all the things that would come from it. Our brains are pretty powerful that way, aren't they? If I had you all talking about where are you going on vacation this summer, you could probably get pretty jazzed up and paint the picture for me. The beach, you can hear the water, the cold beer, whatever it is you're doing. Unfortunately, the second great power that our brain has is opposition. As soon as we come up with that great vision, as soon as we can picture it, what does our brain come up and say? Ah, it can't happen because of this. And you immediately come up with every reason that you can't achieve that vision that you thought you could achieve. But folks, what our brain really has is that third power, and it's called transformation. We have the ability to overcome opposition to create a solution, bless you, to achieve your vision. So if you'd be willing with me, I'm going to walk you through an exercise, it's totally to you, but then I'm going to give you a tool that at the end of this, five minutes, you'll have a strategic planning tool that I will challenge you, if you take it back to your organization, Include your board, include your stakeholders, include your employees, include your volunteers, you'll make a difference. Imagine a goal that you have, and it can be personal. So I'm gonna make one up, because we're close to swimsuit season. I want to look really good in a swimsuit. That's my goal. But think about it in your world. What could that goal be in your organization, in your personal life, whatever that might be? Vision. Second, what are all of the benefits that will come to you, your organization, the community, if your vision is realized? Take a minute and just write down five. Just write down five. If you can't come up with five, three. You have a vision, write down what benefits will result if that vision is achieved. If that vision is achieved, what five things will happen that are a benefit? It could be to you, your employees, the community, your organization, your spouse, your dog.
So you kind of have the point. Now let's take one of those and write a list of the things that are going to stop you from achieving that. Make that list. Your brain can do it. I told you, it's the second thing. It's opposition. We're really good at it. Probably easier to come up with things that are going to stop you, isn't it? Now let's focus on that list. Take any one of those oppositions. What can you do to overcome that opposition? So if I use my example, I want to look really good in a swimsuit when I go on vacation on July 4th. What will those benefits be? I'll feel good about myself, I'll be healthy, I'll be eating right, I can splurge while I'm there and eat all the ice cream I want because I'll be fit. What are the things that are going to stop me? The ice cream today, the french fries tonight, okay maybe another glass of wine. Right, we all have the things. Ah, uh, you know what, I don't want to go to the gym this morning. It feels cold outside. And now what you say is, okay, what can I do to overcome that? Don't let ice cream be in the house. I'm gonna work out with three other people and we're gonna commit to be there at 6.30 so that if I don't show up, I'm guilted into next week. Think about that. Those become your strategies to achieve your vision. And if you then focus on the ways that you're gonna stop your obstacles, the obstacles won't happen. And your benefits will accrue. And your vision will be realized. Bless you, bless you. How many of you, when you go home tonight, know exactly the way to get home. What are the odds of something happening in traffic that might all of a sudden stop everything from happening? Right? It happens. We're, we live in an area where that happens. Do you just sit in traffic and wait for it to stop? Do you just sit there and just wait? You don't just sit patiently, turn the car off and go, okay, I'm going to wait for no traffic? You don't? That's right. You come up with an alternative plan, don't you? What's your, what, what, do you have a tool that allows you to think about then where else would you go if that happened? I do, it's called Waze on my phone. And it says, here are the multiple routes. And if something comes up, it says, hey, instead of turning right, turn left. If you instill this thinking and you get everybody thinking about the vision and you get everybody excited about the benefit, and everybody collectively can identify what's gonna stop us from letting that happen. And then we put a plan in place around those to focus on how are we gonna make sure that that doesn't happen, you will achieve what you're looking to achieve. But better yet, everybody will be on board in the same manner, everybody will completely understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, from the receptionist, to the CEO, to the board chair. And then you can monitor, am I being successful? If you went down Main Street and you knew you were gonna turn on Maple Street till you get on Elm Street, but there was an accident on Maple, you had to turn on Oak. Everybody then knows, hey, there's an accident, we're not gonna get there, everybody, we're gonna turn on Oak. And then communication becomes a great tool and everybody knows what's going on. And back to Mr. Little, that communication the fine young lady here that was talking to me about the hotel, the restaurant, and room service talk to each other. And it's like, hey, somebody wants a milkshake. We gotta figure it out. The blender's in the bar. It's not in room service, but we can take it to the bar and put it in there and make a milkshake. So what I'm gonna leave you with today is this. 
Many of you probably thought you had this all figured out. You probably have a plan that you're working on, although it sits in a three ring binder that sits on the shelf that hasn't been looked at in a while and your employees probably don't even know what's in it. So for you, those of you that are board members, executive directors and leaders, here's my story. Back in the middle 1800s, Samuel Clements was this great writer that everybody knew about. Some of you may know him as Mark Twain. And there was a gentleman that badly wanted to meet Mr. Twain, Mr. Clements. And he heard that he was going to be on a riverboat that was leaving at a certain time, and he bought a ticket to be on that boat. And sure enough, that night at dinner, as he went to the table where he was assigned, Mr. Clements was at his table. He was in heaven. And he's thinking to himself, how do I impress Mr. Clements tonight so that he'll remember me and this will all be awesome? And Mr. Clements looks at him and says, son, will you please pass the sugar? And he thinks, bingo, I got it. Remember, there's a table, right? There's a big table, it's dinner. He wants to impress this gentleman who was probably bigger than life at the time. And he looks at him and he goes, Mr. Clements, did you know that sugar is the only word in the English language where S-U is pronounced shh? And the table looks at him like, wow. Mr. Clements looks at him and goes, well, young man, are you sure? <laughs> so I ask you, are you about your plan for volunteerism? Are you sure you've thought about your plan for your organization to be successful? It doesn't mean that you have to hit the lottery. It doesn't mean that you have to be anything better than somebody that knows how to throw a party. Understanding the guests that you're inviting to make sure that you're throwing a party where everybody involved, from the people that you're serving, to the people that you need to deliver it, to the people that are supporting you, are on board with you. I hope that I've at least given you a little hors d'oeuvre of a party today that you walked away with where our time together has been well spent. I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you for what you do. We need more community people on it. Have a great afternoon.